Thank you for listening to this St. Louis on the Air podcast, supported by University College at Washington University, offering approachable world-class education with undergraduate and graduate programs, part-time, evening, and online. University College at Washington University. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. Memorial Day was a day for us to remember those in the military service whose voices were silenced during their service. The Missouri History Society is helping us to give voice to those who survived it. An oral history project is being compiled for the Soldiers Memorial Military Museum downtown. It's underway. Joining me to tell us about it are Julia Lasher, an oral historian, and Patrick Alley, Milli- Patrick Alley, I'm sorry about that, military and arms curator for the Missouri Historical Society. Clavon Wesley is a U.S. Air Force Vietnam era vet. Well, I stumbled my way through that, folks, but thank you all for being with us. Good to have you. Good to be here. Julia, let me begin with you. Uh, Just give us an overview of what this project is all about. Sure. So the goal of the Soldiers Memorial Oral History Project is to document the history of St. Louisans' experience and participation in major U.S. conflicts, both abroad and on the home front. Um, And we're doing that through documenting the recorded memories of the men and women who served. Um, So the project aims to capture stories from all eras. So we are talking World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Cold War, and conflict in the Middle East all up to the present day. And, yeah, that's the project. That sounds most interesting indeed. Patrick, how is it going to be implemented as part of the overall ambiance of the museum? Sure. So we're working through um, the exhibit process right now. Um, The exhibit's down at Soldiers Memorial when we open on November 3rd. Um, will uh, interpret military history through the lens of St. Louis. So through all of the galleries at Soldiers Memorial will tell the stories of St. Louisans. Now, obviously, um, that's much more difficult to do in earlier conflicts. So, you know, we rely on letters and those sorts of things. But for more recent conflicts, um, and those conflicts that were well, a lot closer to, you know, really World War II, um, Korea, Vietnam, uh, conflicts in the Middle East, we really wanted to rely on the veterans' voices to tell those stories. So we'll be using these oral histories in gallery uh, to really provide insight into what those conflicts meant to the veterans that served in them. Julia, how many uh, have you uh, recorded so far? Um, As of today, uh, we have 24 interviews with 22 narrators. So some of them have so much to say uh, that we've had to do multiple interviews with, with people. So, How are you tracking these folks down? Um, So we are working really closely uh, with community partners and the veterans community, and Patrick and others at Soldiers Memorial have really been working to identify people who um, are willing to tell their story, first of all, because it's not always an easy thing to do, um, and who also will represent a broad and diverse range of experiences that will really um, help interpret the history that's uh, going to be exhibited at Soldiers Memorial. How did you find Clavon? Uh, that's a kind of an interesting story. So I found Clavon. Um, he actually submitted a story to uh, Channel 9 um, in preparation for the Ken Burns Vietnam documentary. Oh. had a program where veterans could send in their stories and they would be displayed on Channel 9. And they would do a little write-up about it. And they shared those submissions with us. And Clavon's definitely caught my eye because it was beautifully written and it was a unique perspective. Um, he was a medic in the Air Force and I hadn't interviewed anyone yet in the medical field. And, yeah, like I said, it was beautifully written, and I thought he had an interesting story to tell, especially as an African-American in Vietnam at the time. Clavon, why did you feel it was important for you to tell your story? Well, I felt it was important to tell my story because my story is about uh, the perspective of being a medic in Vietnam and actually taking care of soldiers from both the Army and the Marines and South Vietnamese uh, soldiers and Korean soldiers who were also fighting there. And so we also took care of uh, soldiers who were from Australia who were housed uh, and fighting the war in Vietnam. So uh, that was an interesting perspective, uh, as Julie was saying, was to give you that point, to give them that point of view. And I thought... uh, this is such a great project. It's it's really humbling uh, for someone like me to actually get to tell this story. And I think, as I said in my story, the thing is to tell the story for all of those other veterans who were 
who are not going to get a chance to tell their story. How, how difficult uh, was it for you to dredge up memories of that time? I'm sure there are some that are quite painful. Yes, there are some memories that uh, are very painful. Uh, and I think what I told Julia, but in a way, what has happened, even with the Channel 9 piece, it really became therapeutic because it gave me an opportunity to look back at my life at a time when it wasn't popular to go off to Vietnam. And so I'm kind of thinking that this is also giving other veterans who don't have a chance to tell their story to to say, hey, I understand that story. I feel part of being part of the the redevelopment and of the uh, Soldiers Memorial downtown. So those veterans will get a chance to go and hear these stories, and the, in some way they will connect. Uh, Julia, you're, you're actually doing the recording and taking these histories yourself, is that correct? Uh, yes, so I'm working with a, a videographer that we have on staff at the museum who is recording the interviews with me. Are you finding it uh, that it's dif- finding out that it's difficult for some of these um, men and, and women, I assume perhaps you're talking to women as well, it certainly should be, uh, that it's difficult for them to, to uh, revive these memories? Uh, sometimes. And, you know, I've had a couple of narrators tell me that, you know, this is one of the only times that they've ever spoken out loud about their experiences. And so that's obviously, you know, a very powerful moment for someone. And I always feel that um, it can be hard to listen to, but if someone is brave enough to come and share their story and know that other people are going to see it, that, you know, I and other people that I'm working with at the Historical Society and at Soldiers can be brave enough to listen and to help facilitate those stories getting told. Patrick, how close are you, given, given what you do at the, uh, with the Society, to these actual histories? Uh, very close. So <clears throat> working with... Um, Working with uh, the interviews that Julia puts together, you know, we we will go through those and incorporate them in a way um, that really puts a face to these histories. So what we're really doing in the exhibits is providing a context uh, with which these uh, these interviews will exist. Um, but once again, putting putting that on. Um, putting really the driving force for those exhibits and those sections that we utilize the oral histories um, Making making the in, oral interviews really speak for those for those periods. Can you give me an example as to as to how Clavon's history is going to be working from your perspective? Sure, sure. So his experience obviously speaks to a number of different aspects um, that we try to represent within the within the galleries at Soldiers Memorial and in the in the new exhibits, um, especially presenting a diversity of experience. So uh, whether that's uh, him as an African American, his role as a medic, his role, you know, different roles that people played in in the military in their in their career and in their service, um, and really reflecting on what their experience meant to them, um, and so. For his uh, his oral history, he'll be within the Vietnam section of the exhibit, and so we will provide that broader context. Um, but really, his voice, um, along with other veterans' voices, will really speak to those individual experiences and the breadth and diversity of, of the experiences of veterans during Vietnam. Clavon, do you get into it at all? Uh, you mentioned during our previous discussion here that uh, it was a hard time for veterans when they came back, for many of them. Do you get into that at all in your in your remembrance? Well, I, th- I think because I was in the Air Force, coming back mm-hmm. was, was a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, I was with veterans who uh, had been in college. They had been through a university system. So most of those Air Force veterans who were medics came back to occupations. They, w- mm-hmm. they went and worked in the hospitals. They went and worked with other doctors. Uh, so when you work with that, that group, it's it's like when we got out, we were all applying for jobs six months out. We we knew that going in, and we worked with thoracic surgeons, chest surgeons, so we had kind of a we, we had an easier time. Coming back was not easy for a lot of veterans, and and when I talked to veterans, they are saying I, they didn't have that kind of experience coming back. And I think one of the projects this project is doing is now that I meet other veterans, they tell me how their experience was. And we, we, it's, it's kind of an amazing because now this experience is crossing across to guys who are in the Army, guys I met guys in the Navy, and I'm meeting new veterans coming back from the Middle East, from Afghanistan, 
And so there's a certain amount of camaraderie ship that's mm-hmm. going on. This project is doing something in the community that I don't think anybody is really taking notice, you know, uh, because I meet other veterans, and we'll say just the other day I met a veteran, and he said, oh, you, when were you in Vietnam, and when were you in Vietnam? And we talk about the Tet Offense, like we were still there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so these stories are being connected surreptitiously without us even knowing about it. That's interesting you say that, uh, I, because I was going to ask you how much of that time of your life is still with you today, and I gather from what you're saying, it's very much a part of your life today. It, it's very much part of my life. Uh, I go to the VA hospital now. Uh, I didn't know I had PTSD until I had a, about 30 years ago. I had an ex- experience, and I had to go to the VA to determine that I had PTSD, I've met other veterans who have 50% PTSD. I've met veterans who have 100% uh, disabilities. And so all of a sudden, you, you kind of realize that all the veterans are connected in a way that is almost unexplainable. You know, you know uh, back in the 90s, I did a lot of interviews with the veterans of World War II as the 50th anniversaries kind of cascaded uh, throughout uh, the uh, 90s, uh, 50th anniversaries of events in the war, Pearl Harbor and, 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 and so on. I never met a veteran of World War II who was in combat who didn't weep mm-hmm. at some point during the interview. Mm-hmm. Not, not once was there an exception to that. Is that kind of emotion still present in your life? Uh, yes, I, I think when they were interviewing me, uh, we got to the point about talking about some of the deaths that I got to see when I was in Vietnam. And there's one particular one that I mentioned in the story, and it was almost like I couldn't go on. I, I just couldn't go on. And I think Vietnam veterans who, like in my case, who worked in the hospital, you know, we we saw a lot of death across the board, not just Americans. I mean, you see, yeah. you see everything. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm sure those oral histories, those guys are going to talk about not only the battles they fought, but the amount of, I don't want to use the word carnage, but... Well, that's probably a good word, because there's <laughs> a lot of that going on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and so these, these veterans probably have seen more death in a lifetime than most people will see in two or three lifetimes. Right. Julia, um, how far back do you go with uh, with uh, living survivors of, of uh, combat and, and war? I think the oldest veteran I interviewed was 95 years old. He was a, a World War II uh, veteran who was a, a bombardier in uh, in Europe. So, mm-hmm. yeah, if they're still willing to talk, then I'm willing to interview them. How, so. how, how vivid are the memories of someone who is that old, number one, and number two, of something that happened 70 years ago? Um, well, that particular veteran um, was was very vivid. I mean, he, he drove himself to uh, my office to be interviewed and got upset with me for holding doors open for him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, yeah, he really had very vivid memories. He participated in, uh, in D-Day and really had super, um, super, yeah, really just you could, you were like, it was like you were there with him. And then, he, you know, he him describing the different bomb runs that he had went on. Yeah, it was it was very clear and very vivid. And I think uh, people that, that listen to these or, and watch these interviews in the museum, it will really add to, to that experience. But How many of these interviews would you anticipate uh, getting, compiling? Um, we're hoping to have around uh, 30 interviews mm-hmm. in the exhibit when it's completed. Mm-hmm. So, Patrick, let's go back a little farther than, uh, than World War II. Uh, given what your job is at the museum, you, you know, you're going to be looking at World War I as well, and there are no survivors of that that I'm aware of. Um, how is that going to be presented? Sure. So actually the exhibits will go all the way back to the American Revolutionary sure. War. Um, you know, no how... survivors of that either. No, <laughs> not around today. Um, I'd love to meet one, but yeah. unfortunately no. Um, so the way we kind of get to those stories is, is in a variety of different ways, um, largely firsthand accounts, uh, letters, diaries. Um, those sorts of resources have proved invaluable to really um, getting to what the individual experience was. You know, our interpretation throughout is 
you know, it's through the lens of St. Louis, but it's through the lens of St. Louisans and their experience. So, you know, in the exhibits, we're telling the stories of St. Louisans um, who served overseas, who served during the Civil War, and, and how we're telling their, their stories is through their words. Um, you know, it's really important. And that's that's a thread throughout. It gets to a lot of what uh, Clavon was saying about kind of that universal military experience. And I think you could put a group of veterans in a room from World War II up through today, and there would be a certain amount of of shared experiences. And so I think you'll see that from even the earliest periods of um, of, of people that were serving in the military, whether that was the American Civil War, Spanish-American War. So you we get through a lot of that in the exhibit. It sounds like it's kind of the Ken Burns approach for that part of the uh, Sure, of sure, which I think absolutely. Mm-hmm. And uh, having those firsthand accounts and having, you know, those um, – those primary sources really drive the narrative. It was really important as we were planning all of the exhibits at Soldiers. Julia, to find a connection between the the reaction of people through their diaries and letters back going back a uh, hundred years, two hundred years, to be very similar to those reactions and recollections of the people you're actually talking to. Oh yeah, definitely. I can definitely see, as Patrick was saying, a, a thread of shared experience that that goes through here. And really, I mean, oral histories are just another primary source that historians use to to interpret the past. But this time, instead of a letter or a diary, it's someone speaking to you and sharing their experience in that very direct and personal way. Clavon, have you had an opportunity to uh, to read any of those older documents that we're talking about? No, I haven't. And it was interesting uh, that he was mentioning documents because I had to do a presentation at school about being a veteran and and what we had to do. And you're not going to believe this, but I still have the uh, letters of recommendation from the thoracic surgeon and my the master sergeant for my job interview at St. Louis University Hospital. (laughs) I still have those letters and one letter. I hold it up. The, the writing is so you can barely see <laughs> see the writing. Mm-hmm. And so as you, as he's mentioned it, there may be other veterans out there who may have letters, um, letters that they wrote to their mom and dad, because every veteran, they made you write to your mom at least <laughs> once a month. Yeah. On the other hand, I have a brother-in-law who saw a lot of action in Vietnam, and to this day he will not talk about it. Whatever medals he won, and he won several from what I understand, he put in a drawer. He won't even open that drawer. So it's tough to get people to sometimes to to talk. I have a caller here, and we have enough time to squeeze that in because I think it's a good point that's going to be made. Gene in St. Louis, go ahead. You're on the air. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. I just wanted to make a note about the um, Missouri Veterans Oral History Project, which is related to a federal project started during the Clinton administration. Veterans of any kind, any era of service are eligible to record oral histories that are video histories. In Missouri, those um, recordings go into the Missouri Historical Society and into the Library of Congress. And I had the opportunity a few years ago with my late uncle to sit in on his recording session. It was the first time this group had ever done a recording in a nursing home. My uncle lived there and was wheelchair bound. He served on the USS Lindsay in World War II, a minesweeper that was destroyed by kamikaze pilots, and he was one of a very few survivors. And yet his story he was a very dry person. It was kind of like watching a documentary or listening to a documentary. And right after that, another gentleman who lived in the nursing home, Don, told his history. He served on D-Day and at the Battle of the Bulge. And his history was full of expletives and froyleins and mademoiselles. Yeah. And at the end of that two hours with those two gentlemen that were both wheelchair bound, I felt like I had watched two movies in my mind. My uncle's was a documentary and Don's was a full color feature film, but it was such a moving experience. And those records are there. They're right. available to any veteran, and hopefully they're a useful resource for your project. Jean, Thank th- 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 thanks for pointing that out to you. Are you aware of that, Julia? Oh, yeah. So yeah. we are, have actually worked pretty closely with the Missouri Veterans History Project, um, really just sharing our, our shared oral history resources. And, yeah, no, that's a, it's a great organization. So. Our time is winding down. Patrick, let me turn back to you. Uh, you, you, The renovation project is well underway. November 3rd is the opening. Where where are we right now? And what what are we going to see that's different? 
Oh, um, I could sit here and talk for 30 minutes um, it, about what's it, different. Do it in but one minute. Sure, you're good. <laughs> sure, absolutely. So um, you've probably seen a lot of changes on the exterior of the building, a lot of renovations that have happened. Um, you know, some of the big things that we want to highlight um, in terms of the renovation are a lot of additions for accessibility to the building. It's been an addition of a ramp, automatic doors, um, the addition of an elevator, those sorts of things. But really what's happening right now is we are really in the thick of uh, – finalizing exhibit development and starting to get casework um, to actually start installing the exhibits. Uh, so all of those things will start moving in in the next couple months. And then shortly after that, um, the first artifacts will start being installed down at Soldiers Memorial. So it's all it's it's really there are a lot of things happening right now. It's a very busy time as we get closer and closer to November 3rd. And Julia, you are right on schedule from what I understand. Yes. <laughs> and so, and I also wanted to add that we quickly, are um, still continuing to fundraise to be able to keep collecting these stories after well, uh, the museum opens in November. We'll put some information on that on our website so that people will know what they can do. I want to thank you all so much for being with Julia Lasher, Patrick Alley, and uh, um, Clay, Clayvon Wesley. Thank you so much for being with us and telling your story. Great to see you all. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.